outro cast. Trevor, aside from having to talk to this guy, how's your day going so far? Um, it's just started. I can't say anything. I had a dream, and I can't remember what it was. Got ready for you, and here I am. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to be connecting, and I'm going to have a lot of compliments for you later on. Before I get to the compliments and ask about your solo album, the first thing is, does anyone call you Trev, or are you Trevor to everybody? Um, a lot of people call me Trev. Most, actually. Wow, now I know. Well, that new solo record... How long was that in the works for? Or are you going to go, well, 40 years? <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's kind of an apt kind of description because, you know, I did a... Once I left the band, I started doing film scores, which uh, yes. I thought it would take time to get into. And I was, I was very lucky. I had a, a chance meeting uh, at a restaurant. Maitre d' came to me and said... Uh, uh, Stephen Seagal owns the restaurant, knows you come here. I don't know if you know the story. but I, I, I did have a question or two about Sensei Seagal that I was going to ask, but I'd oh. like to hear it from your perspective. <laughs> okay, so I went to this restaurant, and after a couple of visits, the maitre d' came to me and said, listen, uh, Stephen is a part owner of the restaurant and would like you to give him some guitar lessons or whatever the, I'm paraphrasing. So yeah. I Absolutely. I'm thinking of getting into film. I've approached some agents and it's kind of a brick wall up there. You know, it's, it's kind of hard. Every question is, uh, I want to do film scoring. Well, what, what movie did you last do? Well, nothing. You know, well, uh, when I was 19, I did one, but not quite the same thing. Sure. And uh, so I went to Stephen's house and we spent a couple of hours playing together. I think I taught him to play the basic idea of uh, Red House, Hendrix's Red House. And he was very thankful. And at the end, he said, anything I can do for you, you know, in essence. And all, all of this is paraphrasing. It's a thousand years ago. You know? And, and I said, Glimmer Man I, is the end result, correct? Glimmer Man was the end result. And just in true cigar form, rather than saying, yeah, I've just finished a movie and... Uh, I'm hoping it does okay. It, it, you know, it was. I've done this huge blockbuster, which comes out, and uh, do you want to do the score? It was not as nonchalant as that. And, you know, I knew um, I was completely comfortable working with orchestra, comfortable t technology wise. I thought, yeah. Well, I know. I know basically what it is. It's all changed because in the old days it was all it was all to paper. There was the first movie I did. I just took a. Sheep went to a hotel and sat there for three weeks with paper and pencil looking at the film. So a different day, computers and the whole thing. Right. And, uh, and I did it. And uh, I remember going to a meeting with the head of Warner Brothers who said to me, why the F should I give you a chance at doing a movie? So I said, what the F chance do you think you've got in talking Steven Seagal out of it? Because Stephen was the boss, you know. Yes. And I did the movie, and uh, it was my first movie. And so, yeah, so, you know, I look back. That just seems like not that long ago. And then I think my third movie was Armageddon, which was a big Jerry Brockheimer film. <clears throat> and I look at back at that, and it's three decades or more ago, and I think, where did this, or not quite more than that, but. Ish, think, yeah. Yeah. I think, where did this time go? It's, it's, Armageddon seems like yesterday. And during that time, I was always I had ideas. My wife calls me the music alcoholic because instead of bottles in every drawer, there's manuscript, you know? So um, I had ideas for, for ages and I just never implement them because I was so busy with film and other things and TV and, and actually uh, the NBA basketball theme and yes. like that, you know, um, which turned me on to basketball. I'm an absolute fanatic. but um, And so the time just kind of disappeared from the last album. And uh, I was determined to do an album. So after touring with Rick and John, I decided, OK, I've got some film stuff to do when, when, that, that, when that ends, which was a lot of fun. Uh, when that ends, um, 
I'm getting into the album. And I, I basically said to my agent and to everybody, nothing, I'm not doing another thing until this is done. Because I tried to start some times before and then, you know, National Treasure came up and this, yeah. oh, that's going to be Basically, special. your filmography, sorry to interrupt, is every movie that my wife turns on TV, uh, she's going through the channels and it comes on, she won't change. Like we were in Canada on vacation last week and Con Air is on. You can't turn off Con Air. So you you basically have this filmography of untouchable classics. And then I look at your discography and that's full of untouchable stuff. And then that doesn't factor in that, hey, you were almost in the band Asia, one of my favorite bands. So you were very difficult to interview because it's like, where do you start with Trevor? It's a, it's, it's a weird thing. I, you know, it's a little bit like the album because, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know, but uh, the album, the working title for the album, because, you know, when I got into it, it was just like, balls to the wall, I'm, I'm doing nothing else. And, you know, sometimes my wife would walk into the studio with a peanut butter sandwich and coffee and say, have you eaten today? And I thought, oh, shit, yeah, no, I haven't actually. Yeah. You know, because it would just be full time. <clears throat> and uh, consequently, I just did nothing else, uh, nothing else but that. But uh, that's a great compliment, by the way, the, um, the film thing. But um, I think also there's very few films I didn't enjoy doing. I mean, e even some that didn't do that well, like uh, The Great Raid, which was a Harvey Weinstein movie, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, great movie. I remember the Prime Minister, President Prime Minister of the Philippines saw the movie. Harvey Weinstein played it to her when he was still out of jail. Right. <laughs> And um, well, we have to add, um, there's this random Buffalo Music Hall of Fame, and it's in the back of a hard rock cafe in Niagara Falls. And I went, yeah, I'll look at that. And they, the last time I was there, they did still have Harvey Weinstein memorabilia up there. So, oh, believe, goodness, he lives on in some way. Wow, that is amazing. Anyway, she said, um, uh, I, I liked the movie because it was about the death march you know, in the Philippines in the Second World War. Yeah. And I was really happy with the score. And I was so flattered when she said, I'd love a copy of the music. And so I got a message from Harvey's office saying, um, send me the music. And I said, oh. And I, then I heard she wanted it. I said, can I not send it to her myself? No. So he, he sent it, I'm assuming. But yes, yeah, so there's so many movies I did, which I loved um, and didn't do well. And then there's, a, a, you know, thankfully, a lot of them did fantastically well. And I, I enjoyed them. There's maybe two or three, which I could have done without. But, you know, plus minus 55 or whatever it was, movies, I, I had fun with it. So when it came to doing this album, the time had almost been truncated into such a small period that, as I say, Armageddon seemed yesterday. Yeah, and Armageddon, I believe the music was supervised by John Kalodner, who was instrumental in your early career, or at least the early 80s part of your career. Is that a coincidence, or is that how you wound up on that film? The, the, no, no, it's complete coincidence. In fact, um, from what I remember... Um, a Jerry a Brockheimer's music person, Kathy Nelson, had had because she's you know scouting around for composers all the time, and uh, she went to see Glimmer Man and told Jerry she liked the music. Something happened like that, and next thing I did the next thirteen Brockheimer movies, so that worked out pretty well. So you mentioned Seagal before, and there's one thing I was hoping that you could help clear up. Because yes. Stephen doesn't do a lot of interviews and he's a private person. So once he says something one time, that's the only source we have for it. So oh. I saw one interview where he talked about how he was playing guitar in the 1960s, which I didn't know how age-wise that makes any sense. But then I've seen this reality TV show thing where he had all of his guitars laid out on his lawn. He's showing off this was B.B. King's guitar, etc. When you started giving him lessons, was he new to guitar or did he just noodle a little bit in the background and he was trying to figure out his leads? I, I don't want to be uh, 
I don't be unpleasant, but uh, it sounded like he was new guitar, to guitar. I, I think, that's what I thought it was. He still does. <laughs> well, anyway, hey, back but to you. He, he does love it. You know, he absolutely loves it. I mean, I did some shows with him. With uh, I remember one I, one I did actually at the BBB BB King Club in LA, and uh, Richie Zambora was playing. So he used to get people to come and jam with him, and uh, he loves it. It's great that he loves it, because if you yeah. didn't love it, why would you do it? So, hey, back to you in this solo record. How long did it actually take once you started it from going, I'm going to do this, to mastering it? I think it was a very a very concerted kind of one-time thing, which took a, around 16 months, I would say, from the, you know, from taking these germs all over the place and then you know, sticking them in in one bag and going, but uh, yeah, the, the the working title "Demographic Nightmare" was because I wanted to just look at all different areas. You know, I did I did tons of session work as a teenager, well, seventeen, eighteen years old in South Africa. Yeah, and in South Africa, the sessions you could be doing a big orchestral score. I remember I I, I played on a movie. Uh, with Anthony Quinn movie, Tigers Don't Cry, from, you know, the beginning of last century almost. And then the next day I'd be doing a country picking chicken thing. So I love doing country music and uh, using the LB bander on the telly. And um, so, you know, there's so many different areas I, I went to on the album. So I had to make sure there was some kind of gluing aspect to it so it didn't sound like some kind of compilation record. And uh, so sequencing it, there's a producer cap, sequencing it was very, very important. Lyrically, it was important to try and tie it together. And, uh, and I just kind of legitimized some of my thought process by thinking, well, my voice is my voice and my guitar style, whatever that is, is, is what it is. And even though it visits different areas, it's, you know, That'll have, those things will be the glue that ties it together. I call you a tasteful shredder. Is, is that a, a positive thing for you? That's, you can play a trillion notes, but you choose not to, except when you feel like it. You know, it's, it's so funny. I remember doing a, a, a class or some kind of, I can't remember where it was, but it was guitar students and they were asking a load of questions and they'd play and it would be blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You've got you've got a facility, that's for sure, but who are you? That would always be the question. Makes sense, but you're not the only musician in the family. Your son played with group love, great credits yeah. otherwise. Is your son as much of a workaholic in music as you are? Uh probably more. I mean he's I mean, I, you know, I was wanting him to play on this album. I mean, COVID hit in the middle of this album and he did help me a lot on the album, but um, there wasn't really much time where he could actually bring in the drums and play it. In fact, Vinny Kaliuda, who's one of the greatest drummers ever, I think, yeah. uh, played on Push. And uh, on my, the, my last uh, instrumental album, he played on that and <clears throat> came to came to my studio and we had a great time with, because of COVID, he had to do it from his studio and we were just sharing files. It was, it was quite funny, but uh, you know, he sent me two, two takes and he said, if this isn't right, just let me know. I'll do it until you're happy. And, uh, and it was unbelievable. It's like, I, I don't know which one to choose. They're both perfect. I mean, it was just amazing. And then Lou Molino, just a brilliant drummer. So Vinny, uh, one of his early gigs, if not his earliest major gig, was Zappa. And connecting yes. the dots here, Zappa basically gave Steve Vai his start because Steve Vai could transcribe stuff into the notation. You mentioned the notation, the transcribing stuff. Was that was there ever a part of your career where you yourself had to do all the notation, all that yourself? Oh, always. You know, I had to go to the army in South Africa. And uh, I became a corporal where you get more money. That's the only reason I became a corporal. Because every time there was a, a uh, what do you, what did they call it? Um, where they line you up and check out whether your boots are clean and everything. 
They always used to just look at me, nod their head and walk off. But I was useful for them because I used to do all the, you know, in South Africa, there was a sanction, a lot of sanctions during apartheid as they should have been. And uh, so one of my jobs was to get all scratched up Benny Goodman albums and transcribe all the parts for the big band. And that's how I became a corporal. So I, bits and pieces of that. And uh, and then they, I also managed to have like a metal band. Um, I'll never forget, we did one show and also played bass uh, many times in the big band. But I remember the one show I played and generals came to the show, these kind of generals. <laughs> yeah. And the next day in the army newspaper, it said, and the, 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 the captain called the band the uh, Rabenites, which was so embarrassing. It was not my name. But he called it the Rabenites. And the next day, in the, the, the Rabenites. And in Afrikaans, it said Deifels Musik, which means devil's music. And we were just playing like Zeppelin stuff, a couple of originals. And uh, so, yeah, transcription was. Uh, and I studied with the most brilliant guy, Walter Money, for orchestration, arrangement, and conducting. And he was brilliant because I'm certainly no, no great student, but he was just phenomenal. And my dad used to say in a joke, often when I was seven years, eight, eight years old, people would come to the house and say to my dad, oh, how's, how are you doing, Trevor? Are, are you reading yet? And my dad would always say, almost facetiously, he read music before he read English. Because he started me when I was you know, barely out of diapers. Yeah. Well, you said your last name right now with relation to the heavy metal band and growing up going to Hebrew school when the prime minister of Israel was Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, yes. There's so many pronunciations of your last name. You seem very go with the flow with any way that you want to say my last name, that's fine. Yeah, I really don't care. I mean, I grew up knowing it and uh, hearing it, going with my mother to the bank, it was Mrs. Rabin. Yeah. So. That's that's how I grew up with it. Uh, but obviously, uh, Rabin was the president of Israel, unrelated to me. Rabin, 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 whatever it is. Uh, as long that's as the ASCAP and BMI checks clear, you're fine, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, I got two more questions for you if you have the time. And Absolutely. please feel free to tell me, Darren, these are terrible questions. Why do you ask that? And the first one uh, comes from a big fan of yours, Grog Zeichner. He wanted to know, as somebody who worked with Tony Scott, Joel, Sch Joel Schumacher, Steve yeah. Meyer, all these great directors, if you had a stock answer, this is my favorite director that I worked with. Wow, that's, there's so many great guys I worked with. Tony Scott was, I mean, I was so sad when, uh, you know, he passed and um, I didn't realize he was in such a bad bad way, dark way, you know, uh, brilliant, brilliant director. Uh, there's there's so many. The, the one I really enjoyed working with was Rennie Harlan, the Finnish director, who I did The Exorcist uh, and uh, Deep Blue Sea and various other movies. Not the biggest movies I've done, but very enjoyable. And, uh, you know, when you're doing Brockheimer movies, um, Jerry has the ultimate say on everything. Right. which is unusual. Most, most other movies, the producer lets the director get on with it. And not so much in Jerry's case. I'd almost have to say Jerry's my favorite director. Because there's less direction in terms of the creativity. He's more, the eyes are on the business. Well, no, the, the funny thing is Jerry came to every music meeting and in the music meetings, he would say, like, in, I remember, in, uh, uh, what was it, National Treasure, where they find the gold. Uh, he, he was looking, and I thought, oh, he's not enjoying this music, because he was so into the music. And I, you know, I stopped uh, the music. I said, Jerry, you don't seem happy. What's, what's the problem? And uh, he said, we got it. The gold doesn't look real at all. What's what? I said, Jerry, it's a music meeting. We're not doing coloration right now. So he is an amazing guy. It really is an amazing guy. And the credits just keep coming. You know, oh, yeah. even if oh. it's something he produced 30 years ago and it gets rebooted, the Bruckheimer filmography keeps growing. 
I remember when he started TV, everyone, a lot of people would say, well, it's never going to work for him. He's, he's, he's this big blockbuster movie guy. And who's, yep. who's the Aaron Spelling today? You know, it's Jerry. Totally. Well, the last question slash topic is your discography and filmography, and this is a compliment, is so disconnected that I don't think a lot of people realize it's the same guy who wrote Owner of a Lonely Heart and that and that and that film, et cetera. It's very disconnected in a good way. And I'd have to imagine there's a lot of unreleased projects. Now, being that you're a session guy, a scoring guy, a band guy, now a solo artist, was there any work at any point in time with any member of Van Halen on anything? They asked me to produce them years ago when Sammy was in the band. And really? uh, yeah, and I went for, I think Mick Jones landed up producing that album. Uh, yeah. He was a good friend of mine. And uh, I remember Eddie, myself, and Steve Lukather, who's a, a fast friend, we went to see Steve Stevens playing at the Roxy, and we 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 ate there and and drank a little bit, yeah, not quite a lot, and uh, and I remember Eddie saying to me, "Don't don't be surprised if uh, some of your because I I'd said I can't I'm going on the road I just can't do it we're going out with big generator I think it was a, and uh, Eddie said don't be mistaken don't be surprised if you hear some of your riffs on the album." And one day, and, and uh, one day, I'm watching. Um, I, I think it was a football. No, it was a rugby game. I think. And music came on, you know, as they transitioned to different parts. And it was the song from a solo album I did called "Can't Look Away," a song called "Eyes of Love." And I, "Eyes of Love," and I thought, "Wow, I haven't released that." Doesn't sound like Lou. It's my riff, but it doesn't sound like Lou. It was, and it's like, wow, it sounds like Alex Van Halen. And then, and the guitars, it's not, it's not me, but it's, it's the riff. And it was Eddie. And I phoned Eddie and I said, uh, hey, Ed, it's Trevor. I just heard Bitularium or whatever. I can't remember the name of the song. And I got this call back and with a lot of, you know, swear words. Like, hey, man, I'm effing sorry. I, I, yeah, it's a little close. Let's work something out. And he was just so sweet and great guy. So yeah, no, we we used, we hung a couple of times. And a good guy. And the small world part of that is you mentioned Steve Stevens, who is offered the lead guitar part in David Lee Roth's band, couldn't do it. Steve I took it. So you were almost on both sides of the Van Halen camp at that point. Yeah, and uh, Steve and I produced Billy uh, Billy Idol for one song, right? Which, which was another really funny story is it, 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 it you know people look at billy and think he's just this punk artist and now the kind of dangerous rod stewart almost the but, rod stewart. that's <laughs> the best description i've ever heard of billy idol wow that okay, was I interrupted you yeah, that's what i said to the manager i said that's what we got to do if i'm producing him he must be there's got to be a picture at every um secretary's table with with billy there instead of rod stewart because time's moved on and um and yeah, he, he's, he's a very well-read guy. He's a very smart guy. People don't yeah. know that. And and spent some of his childhood here on Long Island. People don't think a British gentleman, Billy Idol, as having a Long Island upbringing. But yeah, he's... he's. I didn't know that. I never knew that. Yeah. I was, I was on the same label with, uh, as him, uh, Chrysalis. Yeah. But like a thousand years ago, you know, and... He was this, uh, what was the band called? Generation X. Yeah. Kiss Me yeah. Deadly and all that. Hell of an underrated band. But yeah. yeah. Trevor, the, here's what I've learned today. Uh, nonstop working for you and your son in a good way. The solo album was not the easiest to make due to scheduling, but you're proud of it. There's much more to come. You're easy to work with. And uh, you were in the military. Didn't know any of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, well, hey thank you so much for the decades of amazing music and really looking forward to what's to come whether you're scoring it playing on it singing it whatever it is looking forward man oh man thank you so much it was a joy talking to you thanks a lot Outro cast.